Dr. Eric Byrne, psychiatrist, developer of transactional analysis, and author of The Games People Play. This slim volume, detailing Dr. Byrne's theories, has struck a responsive chord in our society, selling over 500,000 copies since its publication in 1964. Written more for practicing analysts than laymen, the book presents a theory of social relationships that apparently has been easily understood and quickly absorbed by the questioning adult. I'm David Prowett, science editor for National Educational Television. Dr. Byrne invited me to his home in Carmel on the California coast. There, over the course of the weekend, we were able to discuss the implications of the theory and practice of the games people play. Why do you think that a book that was originally written for, well, certainly a professional audience, found such favor with uh, lay readers? I think it's the recognition factor. It's uh, written in language, although it is written for professionals, it happens that we are able to talk about psychological things in very simple words. In fact, we like to stick as much as possible to a basic English vocabulary, and we are able to do it. And so people can understand what it's about, and then they recognize uh, that this has a certain, they can see the reality of it in what happens to them and to other people. And so, uh, really, we, there seem to be two kinds of readers, judging from the uh, uh, reactions that I get. One is the person who says, gee whiz, that's me, and the other is the person who says, gee whiz, that's you, or him, or her. When did you start to write it? I started about four years ago. Actually, I started uh, working on the concept about 12 years ago. But about four years ago, somebody, some of my colleagues who are using transactional analysis in their professional work want to know more about games and they said why don't you write up a catalog of games <coughs> so we'll be able to refer to it and that's really how I came to write the book. Mm -hmm. Dr. Byrne, in a nutshell, what is transactional analysis? It's a system for understanding people's behavior, for trying to change people's behavior and for predicting people's behavior. At the risk of pinning you up against a wall, how is transactional analysis different from other forms of analysis? I think the main difference uh, seems to be that it's in simple language. And, for instance, a lot of the reviews of the book have said uh, this is written for laymen as a sort of a derogatory kind of criticism. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't written for laymen. It was written for professionals. But it just happens that it is possible to say very complicated things about human beings in simple language. Well, does transactional analysis conflict with any of the existing forms? No, it doesn't conflict at all. In fact, it, it supplements them and it forms a, let's say, a basis for using any of the others. It's a very good preparation for any of the others. Does it overturn any of the uh, earlier theories? Not at all. It merely approaches things from a different angle and adds to the whole body of psychological theory. Transactional analysis seems like a much more pragmatic approach. Yes, it is. I think most other therapies uh, think about, uh, talk about thinking and feeling. And our question of the patient is not how to, what do you think or how do you feel, but what are you going to do about it? And uh, there's a story that I think is a little unfair, but anyway, it sort of uh, uh, illustrates what I mean, where uh, the patient came in one day and said to the psychiatrist, uh, by the way, I killed my wife last night and hid her body in the closet. And some people might say, aha, now we got something to work with. What's your interest in closets? Uh, or we might say, uh, why are you killing your wife? <laughs> Dr. Byrne, I'm curious. Do you practice what you preach uh, as transactional analysis? And applied to your life? I think so. Uh, at the beginning, you have to say, like, what's my parent adult child doing? And pretty soon it becomes a sort of a second nature, except when something specifically goes wrong, like in raising children, for instance, with a, to with a teenager. Um, you sort of make mistakes, and then sometimes I really run that through and say, what do I do? And I may decide, gee whiz, uh, 
I thought I was coming on straight adult, but I guess there was a lot of parent in there, so I, that's why he reacted the way he did. And uh, so then I try to correct it. And uh, very often when things go wrong, it comes in very, I find it comes in very handy in my own life. And then there are other aspects besides parent, adult, child. For instance, one of the things that people find strange in our philosophy is uh, the idea of rackets. For instance, the idea that anger is a racket means uh, really there's no reason to get angry uh, and there never is uh, one of the things of, uh, about feelings that people um, talk about uh, is the mythic is, for instance in the case of fear people talk about the mythical man who is chased by a lion and if you're scared the adrenaline comes out and you're going to run mm -hmm. faster well that sounds great except that I've asked many, many people, and I've never yet met anybody who was chased by a lion, so I don't know what good that is. Well, in the case of anger, um, every once in a while I decide to get angry, and it never pays off, and I can, I can see really that what I've done is a sort of self-indulgence, that um, it's sort of fun to get angry, and it makes you feel that you're right and like that, so you wait around for a legitimate excuse, like anybody would get angry at that, and, uh, and then you get angry and you feel very self-righteous, but it never does any good, and it is a racket. So uh, uh, I don't very often decide to get angry nowadays. Sometimes if uh, I'm taken by surprise, I even get angry without deciding to, but uh, it never really is any good. That's a great philosophy, but what do you do if you can't decide to get angry, you just get angry? You don't get angry, you decide. Uh, what you got to do is keep your adult on the ball because anger is always a child or a parent phenomenon and there's no reason for an adult in our sense of the word to get angry so you keep your adult on the ball and there are several things you can do instead of getting angry you can say uh, what's with him and what can I do about it and then it's sort of fun like if uh, somebody's irritating you Instead of letting them win, which they do if you get irritated, you say, uh, why is he uh, trying to irritate me and I bet I can uh, uh, calm him down. And then you have an interesting little project and if you carry through with it, everybody feels good instead of uh, everybody feeling bad. You feel bad because you're angry and you're all stirred up and he feels bad because he collected uh, an anger stamp from you. So you just have this little project and that takes care of it and everybody feels good. That's the, I that's the ideal, I think. In the three ego states, these roles that we all play constantly, are they present in all of us all of the time? Yes, they are, except I want to take uh, exception to your use of the word role because these are not roles. These are uh, psychological reality. The role is sort of an artificial thing, not straight. And these are not roles. They are uh, actual people in your head. Anyway, uh, in answer to your question, they are there all the time. Uh, usually only one of them is active at a given time and the others are kind of uh, out of commission until something puts them back into commission. Well, are the ego states sequential? First the, the child when we're children, the adult when we reach adulthood, and finally the parents when we become parents? Uh, something like that. Uh, the baby starts off with only a child ego state. And then as he uh, goes along, the first thing that happens, I think, is uh, the first uh, adult thing that happens is when he draws what is essentially a scientific conclusion. Now, various people might say it's a conditioned reflex and so on, but to us it looks like a scientific conclusion. And this scientific conc conclusion is that the breast is not a part of me. And that's very much like uh, somebody doing research and deciding uh, this is not part of me. Is it part of me or isn't it? So that's the first adult functioning, and that can happen very young in the baby, obviously, in the first cu couple of months of life. Uh, and from then on, he's uh, beginning to use his adult. I think the parent comes later, but not. Uh, uh, you don't have to wait till you're an actual parent to, to become parental. What happens, I think, in my observations, which are fairly limited, but um, I think the ones I've made are valid, is that the kid starts off first being a tattletale. He says, if you don't put the books back or don't put the dolls back, I'm going to tell mother. And he becomes a tattletale or what uh, you might call a fink. And that's the 
predecessor of the parent, because a little while later he's going to be saying, you, you've got to put the books back before we can go out and play. He said, and that's what he heard from Mother, and then he takes on, comes on like Mother. Uh, he's not playing a role. He really feels it's him doing it, uh, at least after a while. And so that, that's the first development of the actual parent. So they're all developed pretty early. Well, the adult sounds like the really rational yes. part then. Yeah. And the ch how would you describe the child and the, and the parent then? Are they the unstable ones? Uh, the parent is borrowed. And that uh, goes into the field that a lot of people call culture. There's a certain way to be a parent in each culture. And uh, there's certain information the parent has in each culture, which is not rational, it's just tradition. And the adult, as you say, is the rational part. In our way of thinking, the adult is very much like a computer. Uh, it takes in information and works out the best possible solution uh, in view of what's really out there in reality. Unemotionally? Unemotionally, regardless of what mother said, father said, what I want to do, or I wish, or I should have, like that. It's just, what? how do you fix a car? Well, it doesn't matter whether your father or mother liked cars, or you wish you had a bigger car. The problem is, what are you going to do with that car? And in order to fix it, you've got to take it apart and look at it and put it together again. And that's a sort of a computer thing. The child is uh, the spontaneous part of the personality, which is creative, which sees things... Uh, in a naive, uh, rather charming way, in which asks very pertinent questions. And then the child gradually gets snowed under, mostly by the parents, and it starts accepting answers which are not straight or forgetting questions which would be interesting because you're not supposed to ask them. And that's how the child gets corrupted. Eric Byrne has made Carmel his base for the development of transactional analysis. Although he commutes to San Francisco each week to maintain a practice there, he returns to Carmel each weekend to enjoy the peace of this rugged coast with its boiling ocean and capricious fog. I haven't asked you up till now, but you call this transactional analysis. Just what exactly is a transaction? A transaction is what I guess other people might call an interaction. But to me, interaction is sort of a non-committal word. It means that uh, the person is just watching and isn't going to commit himself to anything. When you say transaction, you're committing yourself to the idea that people talk to each other because they're getting something out of it. And so you can move immediately on to the question of what are they getting out of it. Very simple example, if two people say hello to each other, uh, we assume they're saying it for a good reason and that they're each getting something out of it or they wouldn't bother to bother to do it. And that hello is a very simple transaction, like you say hello to me and I answer hello. And it's very deceptive because uh, although it's simple, it's a very important transaction as you can find out by not answering somebody if they say hello to you and you get yourself into real trouble because it is actually a very important transaction. You say hello for somebody to answer you. You're also listening to how hearty they are when they're saying hello. Right. Somebody says hello enthusiastically, and you don't answer very enthusiastically, then they feel cheated. It's almost as though they had a kind of a little machine or cash register in their head that was uh, figuring out how much uh, hello you said and how much they owe you back. So that's why we call it a transaction, is because uh, if A says something and B answers, then they're both getting something out of it, or they wouldn't bother to say it. In other words, the basic question of all social... Uh, interchanges between people is why do people talk to each other? Why do they bother to? And you're constantly evaluating while this is going on and getting something from it. You mean the speakers are evaluating what they get out of it? I think so. They don't. Uh, they don't really stand there uh, making estimates, but the estimates are made uh, sort of automatically, and people feel disappointed. <coughs> Pardon me, if they don't get what they want, and they may also be a little uh, curious if they get more than they bargained for. Well, are all interactions transactions? Is this the only way that people spend their time together? Well, we found that uh, talking about what people can do when they're together in a room, as we would say, or together in a car, 
how are they going to uh, spend their time and our explorations indicate that there are just six different ways that people can do that.